So uh, good morning. Uh, it's really good to see all of you here. Uh, my name is Jimmy, if I haven't met you yet, um, and I'm the director of Church Life. And we are in the middle of a series about strengthening your spiritual core. And uh, Kristen kicked us off last week, and we're going to be talking about this over the next several weeks. And um, when Paul asked if I'd share, I kind of had an immediate reaction, because what we're really talking about are these life lessons that we experience that uh, help us become healthy and help us know what it looks like to be mature and to grow. The things that we're striving for, the disciplines that we begin to incorporate in our life and many times incorporate into our life because they are very hard fought. Um, and there, you learn a lot in those lessons where things are, are hard. Um, and so today, is a, I wanted to share a little bit of my story with you, but I also wanted to share a passage um, that I've spent some time on um, that I think is probably understated when it comes to the gravity of what was really happening here in this passage. Um, and we're going to uh, project it on the screen because uh, this is taken out of Galatians chapter 2, uh, but I'm actually going to read it out of the New Living Translation. Uh, there's a few words and nuances in it that I really liked. Um, so you do have a CEB Bible. You're welcome to, to follow along there. It'll be close enough. Um, but the New Living Translation I'll have uh, posted here. And I want to read it together and then kind of dissect it a little bit with you. So read with me Galatians chapter 2, 11 through 16. Now, I want to set this up really quick. This is uh, the Apostle Paul. This is a letter that he is writing to the church in Galatia. Um, I'm going to show you a map here in a few minutes about where Galatia is, but it's central Turkey. If you can visualize that. These are not Jewish people. These are, this is a place where Paul and many of the Jewish leaders have gone to plant churches and try to build up communities centered around the message of uh, Jesus Christ. Um, and this interaction happens when Peter, the Apostle Peter, is already there, along with several other key figures, and then the Apostle Paul shows up, and here we have, we walk in on this scene kind of happening in progress. So follow along with me, Galatians chapter 2, starting at verse 11. But when Peter came to Antioch, I had to oppose him to his face, for what he did was very wrong. When he first arrived, he ate with the Gentile believers, who were not circumcised, but afterward, when some friends of James came, Peter wouldn't eat with the Gentiles anymore. He was afraid of criticism from those people who insisted on the necessity of circumcision. As a result, other Jewish believers followed Paul, Peter's hypocrisy, and even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. When I saw that they were not, when I saw that they were not following the truth of the gospel message, I said to Peter in front of them, Since you, a Jew by birth, have discarded the Jewish laws and are living like a Gentile, why are you now trying to make these Gentiles follow the Jewish traditions? You and I are Jews by birth, not sinners like the Gentiles. Yet we know that a person is made right with God by faith in Jesus Christ, not by obeying the law. And we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we may be right with God because of our faith in Christ, not because we have obeyed the law. For no one will ever be made right with God by obeying the law. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. So uh, as we're talking about this idea of change, uh, many of you know that when I got here, I got here about almost five years ago, and I came pretty broken. Um, I was in a really interesting season of life where I knew that there were important things that I wanted to do. There were things that I believed in. The fact that this church had a job description for a mission, part-time missions director, it was part-time youth, part-time mission, um, was really out of the ordinary and yet exactly kind of what I was looking for because that mission's part of things, going to, to help the poor, to reach out, to better the world as we know it. Those were one of the few Things, those were some of the few ideas that I was still holding on to because a lot of my life had kind of imploded on me. Um, as I was coming to terms with my own identity and coming out of a ministry area that um, had changed pretty dramatically, I found myself really trying to figure out what was left. And that whole process has be began a deconstruction 
of the foundations of my faith. And, and, I, and I came out of a tradition that really prizes a sense of surety, a sense of knowing what you believe. The mark of a believer is becoming more and more set in your ways and, and knowing, having convictions around the things that you have discovered to be true. And that was rewarded and praised, and, and I had gotten pretty um, good at those disciplines. And then all of a sudden, I had to kind of pull the rug out from under me, and a lot of that happened against my will, because I had to start asking questions of, can I really exist as a person, as who God made me to be, with all of these rules, traditions, outlines, and beliefs. What still is true if I change this one thing? A lot of my theology was like a house of cards that I pulled one card out from the bottom and everything felt like it had crashed down. And so I was in this place even when I came to Second Presbyterian Church where I started to find a group of people and I found a community and I found leadership that were starting to, to pinpoint and and identify some of those foundations, I was like, I can still hold on to that. That still works for me. And the patience and the grace of this leadership of this session to say, we prize journeys far more than destinations. And that was a message that I really needed to hear, and one of the things that I love about this community. But it was really hard to face that idea of the things that I had held on to in a culture that prized knowing what you believe and being willing to die for it and having to go back and say, but what if one piece of it is wrong? What am I going to do? And there's a little part of that story that gets mirrored in this passage here in Galatians. What we have is Peter and Paul um, having to decide what to stick with. What part of the Old Testament Jewish law um, that they have followed as Jews for thousands of years and they have become experts at practicing, what parts of those things are they holding on to because they're truth? And what part of those things are they holding on to because it's just the way it's always been done? See, so I want to kind of break this down. Can we dive into this passage here a little bit and really get into some history and, and Greek? Um, when we walk on the scene, we see Peter. Now, just so you know the context of the story, um, Jesus has already happened, Jesus has ascended, Pentecost has already happened, and that was actually a big moment, Pentecost, when um, Peter and the apostles are anointed, and they, they begin to preach this message of inclusion. Everybody is now welcome. We have opened the door, and we have provided a way for everyone to be a part of what is going on here. Also, before this time, Peter has had this dream and this is back, back in Acts before this time. And you'll remember this. In this dream, a sheet is lowered from heaven in his mind's eye that is filled with a bunch of unclean animals, unclean by the Jewish uh, law. And the voice from heaven, God says, kill and eat. And Peter has this repulsion, this absolutely not. Are you trying to trick me? You know that that's not what we do here. And God says, if I have made it clean, then don't consider it unclean. And the, as the passage goes, Peter has this dream three times and then has to wake up and immediately has to begin to act on it as he begins to interact with people that aren't specifically from the Jewish faith. So Peter has had this pretty transformative personal experience with Jesus Christ. He has also had this dream that is starting to build within him a conviction of, I don't know that I can live by the same traditions that I have. And so two big things are happening in this scene when Paul approaches Peter is surrounded himself with a bunch of Gentiles, and he is eating with them. So if you go back to Deuteronomy chapter 7, there are a group of seven Canaanite tribes that the Israelite people have been commanded not to eat with or interact with. They were well known for being idol worshipers. They just were terrible influencers on the Israelites. But other than that, there was actually no Jewish law that said Jews could not eat with non-Jews. It became a tradition. And because it was applied to one group of people, and they were like, look at all this heartache that it saves us. All of a sudden, they're like, let's just apply that to all people, and then we'll be good. The point wasn't actually about eating. The point was is that if I ate with them, eventually that would lead to intermarrying with them. And that was the thing that they really wanted to avoid 
a lot. They wanted to maintain the purity of the Jewish culture and the kind of isolation of the Jewish people and wanted to be fruitful and multiply. The second thing is that, and this is, comes up in a lot of Paul's epistles, this idea of how important is circumcision comes up in almost every, um, almost every time that Paul's trying to interact with the, the Jewish leaders. And that actually is a little bit more clear cut because that goes back to Genesis 17 when God and Abraham have this little moment and God says, you will be my people. I choose you as a sign of our covenant together. You will be circumcised. Your kid will be circumcised, all of the people in your house, and teach your people to do this. That's, it's a little bit more straightforward. And so the Jews have dutifully been practicing this idea of circumcision for thousands of years and here we are, and we arrive today. So the one exception to the whole, can I intermarry with non-Jews? The exception was made and became part of the norm if the person you married converted to Judaism. And so it wasn't that these are two unrelated ideas. The first thing to do to convert to Judaism is be circumcised. So all in all, all of this is connected. And here, so here you have Peter, who is living by this new norm, this new ideology, where he is allowed to eat with non-Jews, and he is allowed to intermingle and make friends with and congregate with people who are not only uncircumcised, but don't believe that it is necessary. We'll get there here in just a second. And then all of a sudden... James, friends of James show up and the Jews are watching Peter to see what is going to happen and Peter chickens out. And so Peter leaves what he's doing and he goes back, isolates himself with the Jews, separate, basically betraying everything that he had just been trying to convince these people of. So I want to just tell you a little bit culturally about... Um, where Galatia is. I mentioned earlier that it's there in central Turkey. And circumcision is one of those things that may not have been a big deal for the Jewish people. It was, while it was a badge of honor, it was also just a box that you checked. On the eighth day, you circumcised your kid. It was part of the ritual. It's what you did. And, and it was the way for you to not only state your loyalty to the faith, um, but it was just part of the tradition of what you did. So in Jewish culture, to be uncircumcised was to be seen as odd, as to be seen as out of the group. But if you go to Galatia, Galatia lived far more by Greek customs than they did by Hebrew customs. And in Greek culture, the idea of circumcision was unthinkable. It was considered repulsive. It was considered, um, di it, was, it was a disregard. Um, there was an inferiority complex to it. And so it wasn't just, it wasn't the badge of honor of look at the elite, look at the sacrifice that I have made for my faith. The idea of you are circumcised, then you are strange, you are ostracized. And quite honestly, the people of Galatia just couldn't understand why it was important. And so a lot of them were very against this idea. They bought into the message. They loved what they said, uh, the, the um, foundations of the faith of the people of the way of Christianity, but they couldn't really understand this. And so Peter and Paul are coming in and having these debates of, well, how important is it really? I know we've always done it, and I know we do, but at the same time, here we are having a group of people, and their hearts are in this, and yet they're getting tripped up on this tradition that we have. And so Paul comes in, and he sees what Peter has done. Paul, Peter has lived according to these ideologies, and then all of a sudden, like in the moment of truth, he kind of bails, and Paul comes in and be like, we talked about this. You had your, your dream. You followed Jesus. Paul has his own transformational experience on the road to Tarsus. He sees a big light, um, and he begins to realize, like, wow, this is not what I thought it was, and he has this heart transformation and here they are having this big discussion. And if you continue to read through this whole um, deal, Paul goes into quite a bit of apologetics on why he feels like he can justify changing this particular part of his worldview and his theology. So the key verse here really is um, chapter 2, verse 14b, 
why are you now trying to make these Gentiles follow the Jewish traditions? And that word traditions is the Greek word, I'm going to see if I can pronounce it correctly, you did so. And it basically means to Judaize. Um, our comparison would be to westernize or to Americanize. The idea wasn't just to practice the principles, it was to assimilate into our culture. The hope was that you would become like us. This idea of traditions and truth was really under scrutiny here, and it's really what Paul and Peter are trying to determine, which is which. A journalist and activist named Madhu Kishwar um, wrote a piece for the Economic Times. Um, she's from India, and this is what she says about her own experience. She says, traditions are not cast in stone. By their very nature, they're supposed to evolve constantly and meet the changing requirements of time and social contexts. In India, tradition is forever recharging itself. Traditions that become ossified automatically start losing relevance and die. The moment a tradition ossifies, it becomes a liability. Now, what's interesting is, as earlier in her article, she makes the statement of um, not all modernization is good. And the illustration she uses, if kids only ate junk food, are they actually healthier? So the idea of bringing junk food as a modern uh, asset to our, to our cuisine isn't actually a better idea for us. So even her, uh, in, her own, uh, in her own work, she's talking about this idea of, are all traditions good? Are all traditions outdated? And I love the word she uses, but they're recharging themselves. Gandhi said, it's good to swim in the waters of tradition, but to sink into them is suicide. So here you have the Apostle Paul coming in, and the truth is, is that Paul is changing the rules. And quite frankly, this is the same kind of heresy that they really got onto Jesus about. Because Jesus would say things like, I've not come to change the law, and yet he would say things like, but if it, it's okay, like, don't starve your friend on the Sabbath just because it's the rules. Like, Jesus talked a lot about the nature of the heart. There's a gravity happening here, but Paul has looked at these practices of not specifically not eating with Jewish people and not associating with people who don't agree on the circumcision conversation, and he's looked at it and judged it to be fundamentally xenophobic. He's evaluated the outcome in the modern day, and he says later in the passage in verse 21, he says, if keeping the law could make us right with God, then there was no need for Christ to die. See, think about this from a Jewish perspective. Keeping the law was exactly what could make you right with God. They had been preaching and using that metric, that rubric, for thousands of years as a way to be closer and right with God. And Paul is saying here emphatically, I will repeat it, for if keeping the law could make us right with God, there was no need for Christ to die. This is, this is a dumbfounding statement. It's a terrifying statement because if we reevaluate something like that, then what else do we have to reevaluate? Is it do we have to throw it all out how do we not throw the baby out with the bathwater? And so we have this tension, we have this muddy waters, we have this insecurity of, wow, something we've discovered is really good, but we have these things that have worked so long for us. And I'll just refer you back to the story I started with in my own deconstruction. Everything seemed to make sense as long as I fit into this little box. And then all of a sudden, a major piece threatens that, and now what am I left with? So there's a Greek word I want to share with you, teach you, called metanoia. And metanoia um, is often translated as the word for repentance. But metanoia actually has a deeper meaning, and it's used in rhetoric as the idea of a self-correction. And it's actually in, in debate and rhetoric, it would be included within a, sing, a, a single sentence. And it's the idea of you state something that is fundamentally correct, but then you restate it in a clearer, more accurate way. 
For example, outside it is raining. Or there is a picnic canceling downpour outside. Okay? So like the first statement wasn't fundamentally incorrect, but I actually, my point was to try and make it clearer and more applicable to what we're talking about. The Hippocratic Oath has a metanoia statement in it. It says, our goal, our job is to help, or at the very least, do no harm. It is a self-corrective statement that doesn't negate the first, but replaces the first because it is of greater value. It is clearer and more accurate to what we're talking about. And fundamentally, this is what Paul is doing. He is looking at the Jewish law, and he is saying it is not fundamentally incorrect. However, it is time to look at it and state it and restate it in a more clear and more accurate way. Because the objective of that statement 3,000 years ago is not the same objective and statement as it applies to today. In fact, today it has become harmful and exclusive, and it is keeping people away from the truth. This is, I, I picked this, this particular uh, scenario because this is a profound shift in the Jewish faith for the Jewish people, the burgeoning Christian community, the early church, and trying to figure out what they are going to stand on. The truth is, in my past ministry, I, I think back to uh, talks that I gave, sermons that I preached, that I preached with great conviction and gusto that today I would fundamentally disagree with. And I have to look back on those statements and say, thank God for grace, because then my heart was in the right place to say what I said, and I, and I believed it with all my heart. But as I have grown and as I experienced life, there is some, I need to restate that part of my worldview in a better, more clear way because I believe that it is closer to the heart of God than, it was, than whatever I had said in the past. Growth is not a straight line. It's not a point A to point B. It's not a slow, methodical trip up the mountain. Growth is a spiral. It's, it's a circling that we have where we keep coming back to and revisiting the places that we have always been. T.S. Eliot says, we shall not cease from exploration, and the end of all of our exploring will be to arrive back where we started and to know the place for the first time. And the reality is, is looking at our theology, looking at our traditions, looking at our practices is a constant revisiting and looking at is how we're doing this reflecting the heart of God. I'll, I'll be honest, after the first service, I went back to my office and I was like, I still don't know that I have boiled this down to the statement that I want to make in this talk. And so I began writing and this is what I came up with. If you remember nothing from, from this talk, this is the thought that I want to challenge you with. When something new comes along that looks more like the heart of God and the message of Christ, will I be willing to reevaluate and change because of it? When something new comes along that looks more like the heart of God and the message of Christ, will I be willing to reevaluate and change because of it? I'll be honest, when I got here six years ago, I was in a life or death situation. I didn't know what I was going to do about my theology and my faith and how I was going to reconcile it with who I was discovering, the person that God ultimately had created me to be. It was a life or death moment. And I realized that not everyone gets the luxury of a life or death moment to challenge what they fundamentally believe. I, I was very concerned in writing this, and I asked the staff to, to listen to my overthoughts that this is some criticism of tradition because that's not my heart. It's really not. I think the church has some beautiful traditions, and it's one of the things that I love about this space is it's, it's filled with memories, and it's filled with care um, that's set in time, and I don't want this to be a criticism of that. What I am saying is for me to live out a spiritually healthy life means that I have to live willing to adapt and grow with the times, the things around me, the things that I discover, the stories that I hear, the stories that I live out. 
And am I willing to do that? Because I'll tell you, six years ago I did, and it was terrifying. And I believe that I am a healthier, better person because of it. And a lot of that has to do with being here, with sharing life and space with you all, by being on journeys alongside people. Because I think that we are discovering new things every day. We're having to tweak and look at the real foundations of faith. I want to leave you with this story just for you to consider. When I was in seminary, uh, one of my classmates uh, and a group of people were planting a church. It was a non-denominational church, and so they were getting together to write out their statement of faith. What do we believe as a group? And after weeks of trying to figure out how to uh, write that down and how, how to word it, they were left with a single statement on the page. And I've never forgotten this. It said, the only statement that we can all agree on right now is this statement, I believe Jesus was right. Whatever Jesus meant by whatever, by all the things that Jesus said, I believe Jesus was right. And they used that line as their statement of faith for the first few months of this church's life. It eventually grew and they began to, but they basically said, if, if we can come down to love God and love other people, let's start there and figure out what that ultimately looks like and becomes. And I've always cherished that because it really talks about the foundations of what we're really talking about. And I want to challenge us to be the kind of people who love God and love others and stay centered in the present, loving and commemorating the past and all the beautiful memories and looking forward with great anticipation to a changing world and what that's going to look like tomorrow. We're going to move into a time of reflection. So I want you to think about what it means that Jesus was right.